The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Week 3 for S2S uh, webinar series. As most of you are aware, uh, this monthly series is co-sponsored by, co by the uh, uh, OER Weather Program Office S2S program and the National Weather Service OSTI Modeling Program. And I am Mark Olson from the S2S program, and we are now going to be resuming this uh, series after a bit of a couple-month break here at the end of the summer. And so before we begin, I wanted to remind everyone of our website. I'll post the address in the chat box here shortly. Uh, but on the website, you can find information on upcoming talks. You can add yourself to the mailing list, and you can access the recordings of past talks as well. Um, and I really want to highlight the fact that there's a form available if you're interested in presenting for, at a future webinar. Um, and especially because we do have a lot of spots open over the next couple of months. Um, and so we... Uh, are actively seeking uh, presenters for over the next couple of months. So I encourage you to uh, uh, let us know if you've got something you'd like to uh, present. So finally, um, if you have any questions for the speakers, uh, once we get going here, um, there is a discussion document. It's a Google document, um, uh, which is linked in the uh, chat box. I'll probably periodically post that link in there as well, um, so it doesn't disappear too much. Um, and anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. So today we have actually two presentations. Uh, we're going to start here with Dr. Maribeth Arcodia, and she's going to be talking about identifying subseasonal forecasts of opportunity using explainable AI. And then after that, Nakbin Choi will speak about their work evaluating moist static energy related to boreal winter intraseasonal tropical waves in UFS P8. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll turn it over to Mary Beth. Hello, everybody. Um, I just want to check, are you seeing my screen here? We are seeing your video. We're not seeing your screen. Okay. Oh, I see. So now you're seeing it, right? Uh, I have not seen it yet. Still no? Ah, uh, there we go. Just popped up. Okay. There we go. And Let's it's go. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my name is Maribeth Arcodia. I'm a research scientist at Colorado State University, and uh, I'll be talking about the subseasonal forecasts of opportunity using explainable AI. And so to help motivate uh, this work here. This um, subseasonal desert of predictability is something that's been discussed um, for a number of years now and refers to the fact that the subseasonal time scale or this bridge between weather and climate um, is a very consequential time period, but uh, has a notably lower forecast skill uh, than both the weather and climate time scales. And so instead of trying to focus on improving uh, this overall subseasonal time period, we instead look to focus on certain predictable time periods within this subseasonal time scale. And so uh, these are what we call these predictable states of the climate system that can actually improve some of these subseasonal forecasts or what are known as forecasts of opportunity. And so um, uh, a large group within the community rely on these climate states or these modes of climate variability to actually identify these forecasts of opportunity and also some of this interference between these climate modes. However, looking at a picture like this with that contains um, 
a lot of the variability, it can be really hard to parse apart um, and actually extract some information from this system. And so this helps motivate the use of machine learning. And so machine learning is this tool in a climate scientist toolbox. And the general idea here is that we have a noisy climate system, and then we feed it through this machine learning algorithm or a neural network to actually extract these predictable climate signals from the noisy climate system. And so the research goal here is to identify subseasonal forecasts of opportunity. So I'll be taking a data-driven approach here and highlighting how this explainable machine learning can help pinpoint forecasts of opportunity and then also explore their sources of predictability. And I'll be focusing on two studies that are using this approach, one looking at wintertime West Coast precip and then summertime Midwest precip. So now getting at this explainable machine learning aspect here. So first, um, the machine learning technique I'm using is called an artificial neural network. This has gained a lot of attention um, and momentum, especially in the past few years. Um, but the idea here is that you have some sort of data or input. You feed it through this neural network. It's often thought of as a black box. Um, but it's really good at capturing nonlinearities to make some sort of prediction or output. So a little bit more of a nuanced look here is that you're actually feeding information through this neural network, making a prediction, comparing this to some truth, and we're minimizing a specified loss function. We go back through the neural network, updating these weights and biases within the network, and then ultimately minimize this loss function to make the best prediction possible. And so where the explainable part comes in is that we not only want to build a network to actually make predictions, but we want to use it as a tool to actually figure out what the network learned. And so this is where explainable AI or um, XAI comes in to actually be used to explain how the network makes its predictions. And so what we're looking at here is the decision-making strategy of the network. And we do this through what are known as explanation or relevance heat maps. So an example of this here is say, let's say we have a picture of a rooster and uh, we want the network to identify what this image is. And so it says it's a rooster. Great. However, with just that prediction, we don't actually know what in that picture made it make that prediction. What was the decision making strategy? So we use XAI to open the black box and we can go back through the network to actually make these heat maps of the relevant um, of the relevant grid cells. So here we see the crown of the rooster, maybe like the beak, so identifiable features. Now if we look at this a little bit more, we have an image of a cat here. We see the pointy ears, the nose and the whiskers. But then for this picture of a horse, it correctly identifies that it's a horse, but it's showing that the most relevant was this bottom left corner. And so it's hard to see in this image, but if you zoom in, this is actually a watermark of these images. And so all of the training data for this particular problem had watermarks on the horse images. So even though it was a correct prediction, it wasn't necessarily for the right reason. And so this is where XAI is really important in building the machine learning tools and actually understanding what they're doing. I also took this example from a um, dentistry research journal, which just helps highlight the breadth of these applications across fields. And so XAI can really help us gauge trust in our models. It can help us fine tune and optimize, do things faster. And then ultimately it can help us learn new science. And this is where I'm really focused on here. And so next we talk about leveraging machine learning to actually quantify confidence. So let's say we have this image here of a number and we're trying to predict, we're tasking the network to say what number it is. Well, with a every output of the ML, we get an associated confidence or a probability of it being each of these options. 
And so ultimately it selects the highest probability and we can actually quantify the confidence in the probability of the predicted output. So now let's see this actually put to work here. Uh, the first is looking at um, tropical convection as a subseasonal predictor of West Coast precipitation. This was published in um, the, environment, the Journal of Environmental Research Climate last year. Um, and so here now we have this artificial neural network set up. So I take 10 ensemble members from the CESM2 large ensemble. We take 100 years of daily data from November to March. So 100 years times 10 ensembles is 1,000 years of daily data. And I take tropical precip maps where each individual grid point is an individual predictor. And so we use these input maps to predict whether the rainfall in each of these three grid cells will be above or below normal in weeks four to five. Now, I realize this is the th week three, four seminar, but this work was done before that, um, but it still fits the bill here. So we're taking, we're predicting the sign of the subseasonal precipitation anomaly um, on weeks four to five in these three grid cells. So first, what we want to do is, does our network even have any skill at all? So here are our three regions, Alaska, Pacific Northwest, California. The gray X is here showing skill from random chance, and the um, colored squares here are showing the accuracy uh, for each of those 10 ensemble members. Because we're either predicting positive or negative anomalies, around 50% um, is equal chances. And we see that for all three of our regions, we have skill above random chance. But recall that we actually want to learn information from these networks and we can quantify confidence. And so with each prediction, we have an associated confidence value. And so we can plot accuracy as a function of confidence, where here we have all predictions. And as we move to the right, confidence is increasing. So these are our more confident samples. And we see that as the network gets more confident in its predictions, accuracy also improves. And so, uh, we can actually take these 20% most confident predictions, which are also the most accurate predictions. This means that there were more predictable time periods or maps of that tropical preset map that led to both more accurate and more confident forecasts. These are what we call forecasts of opportunity. You can also compare this here to the gray line, which is random chance, and it is not inherent in a network that as confidence increases, accuracy increases. So we're actually identifying some real predictable time periods here. So if we now look at just the accuracy of those more confident time periods, that's what we see in the diamonds here, we can see that the accuracy overall improves and is now significantly above that of random chance. We next want to explore, well, what did the network learn to get these accurate predictions? And this is where these XAI relevance heat maps come into play. So here, these are composites of the um, heat maps or the relevant regions for the 20% most confident and correct predictions, i.e. our forecast of opportunity, where the darker purple colors here are referring to more relevant grid cells to making a forecast of opportunity. Here we're looking at just California, but we see uh, for negative precip on weeks four to five, we see the tropical Indian Ocean and some of the tropical Pacific. And then for the positive anomalies, the um, tropical Pacific really stands out. Now, these are associated with um, our known sources of predictability, um, the MJO and ENSO here. And so what we find is that the network is actually able to identify physically meaningful sources of predictability associated with the periods of enhanced skill. And so um, combining our climate knowledge, our climate dynamics knowledge, and then utilizing XAI, we can then identify these sources of predictability. Um, we also can 
use the predictability that's quantified via the net neural networks to actually assess the subseasonal predictability on decadal timescales. So decadal variability of subseasonal predictability. And here we see a time series um, with accuracy as a function of time. And the gray and the blue lines here are showing the variability of the accuracy for all predictions and the least confident predictions. And we don't see that much change over time. However, if we look at the purple line here, on just the 20% most confident, our forecast of opportunity, we see significant variability over time. And we see periods of really low skill below that of uh, random chance, as well as periods of really high skill, again, decadal time periods. And what this means is that there's certain low frequency time periods that have higher subseasonal predictive skill and confidence. This leads to increased predictability um, on these longer time scales, and we found that it actually relates to the teleconnectivity of the tropics to the U.S. West Coast and whether that teleconnection is actually set up on these decadal time scales. And so uh, everything I've talked about so far is using CESM2. We um, Machine learning is very data hungry and um, requires a substantial amount of data to train, which is why we utilize climate models. However, uh, it is important to note that there are biases in climate models um, and that they're not necessarily representative of the real world. And so what we do is we take those networks trained on CESM2 data and we run inference, or we basically take those models and test their predictive skill with ERA-5 data. And we use 1959 to 2021. And what we find here is that we still have skill above random chance, especially for the forecasts of opportunity. And what this means is that the networks have identified predictable states of the climate system within CESM2. These networks were not retrained on ERA-5, but when we make predictions with it, we find that the networks are able to make accurate subseasonal predictions that are applicable to the real world. So now shifting gears a little bit is a similar setup, but now for summertime Midwest precipitation. And this is a study that's currently in review at the Journal of Geophysical Research Atmospheres. And so we generally have poor forecast skill in the Midwest in the summertime, but this is a really important region for our agriculture, for wheat, soy, dairy, um, and the precipitation in this area uh, greatly changes the agriculture there. Um, and so uh, we now look to pinpoint the moisture sources for the Midwest precipitation. And so it's been shown that extreme precipitation over land cannot be sustained by lo local moisture recycling alone. So what this means is that we need to look to the ocean. And what we see is that about 86% of um, moisture that evaporates out of the ocean, only 78% of that falls back into the ocean. That means about 10% of the moisture that evaporates over the ocean is transported onto land. This is where sea surface salinity comes into play as a potential predictor. And so positive salinity anomalies, or saltier waters, indicate evaporation and moisture export out of the ocean, uh, while negative salinity anomalies indicate precipitation and fresher waters. Uh, this has been um, demonstrated on seasonal timescales where North Atlantic salinity uh, can provide enhanced seasonal skill for summertime Midwest precipitation. And so we ask, can sea surface salinity be a subseasonal predictor of heavy Midwest precip? So now again, we have an artificial neural network set up. We're using 10 CESM2 large ensemble members, um, but now we're using maps of North Atlantic sea surface salinity anomalies. And we're now predicting whether there will be 
a heavy rainfall event or not on leads from zero to eight weeks. And so we classify a heavy rainfall event as being in the upper 80th percentile of that ensemble member. And now we're making predictions from zero to eight weeks. And so because we have this transition across time scales, we, we apply this Poisson weighting scheme where we basically smooth out the predictions as a function of lead time. And so here we see a time series where the blue is the original raw data set, and then the colored lines here correspond to the Poisson weighting. And really, all that's important to take away is that this is now broadening the event window from a deterministic to a probabilistic forecast, so that way we're actually accounting for uncertainty as the time increases. And so we first want to assess network performance, and now we have a function of lead time here, uh, 0 to 56 days. And we see that the accuracy actually peaks on this sub-seasonal time scale, again, only using sea surface salinity as a predictor. We also want to quantify confidence, and again, we see that accuracy increases as a, as a function of confidence. We pinpoint our forecasts of opportunity. And we see notably higher skill, particularly on 7 to 28 days. This is a really difficult time to forecast. And again, using only sea surface salinity anomalies, we found that there's predictability for these subseasonal forecasts of opportunity. Now, looking into what the network learned, here we're only looking at composites of the salinity anomalies. And we see that for the heavy precipitation events, we see these saltier waters, again, indicative of evaporation and moisture export, um, on a three-week lead. While for the non-heavy or the light precip events, we see um, negative rainfall anomalies or uh, fresher waters. So when we do an XAI, here we're using what's called gradients, or computing the sensitivity of the grid point to the prediction. The darker purple colors here are showing that when the water is saltier, or the saltier the water is, the more confident the network is in a heavy precipitation prediction. And so we find that these subseasonal forecasts of opportunity are informed by positive salinity anomalies in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Um, we did a comparison to SST um, as these two variables are linked, but also SST is a more commonly used um, variable for prediction. We see that the skill is fairly similar, while um, sea surface salinity is still outperforming um, SST a bit, uh, but current work is actually analyzing the vertical resolution to see if um, higher resolution of salinity can better capture that relationship with evaporation and precipitation um, and create more of a skill difference between SST and SSS. And then um, we ask, well, what about the real world again? And so here, um, we now use a, this water accounting model, two layers, or the WAM2, and actually calculates moisture recycling ratios. So it tracks where evaporation occurred, which eventually fell as precipitation in a specific region. So this is using ERA-5 hourly data uh, for the summertime. And the blue regions here are showing where moisture that fell in this box originated from. We see that um, a decent amount is locally recycled, but we also see that a significant moisture source for uh, the Midwest in the summer is the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. And so this means that the regions that were identified by the neural networks are actually found to provide a direct moisture source for precipitation in the Midwest. And so there's actually a physical link here uh, which connects all of uh, these dynamical features. And we have the North Atlantic subtropical high, um, where the lower branch is attached to the Caribbean low-level jet. In the summertime, this Caribbean low-level jet turns right or northward um, and links with the Great Plains low-level jet, which um, 
creates a physical link for actually connecting the evaporation sources here in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico to actually transport moisture to the Great Plains. And so lastly, we can actually look at a case study here in the real world. And we look at this um, 2013 flooding event, which was considered a one in 500 year flooding event um, with 10 fatalities, $400 million in damages. And we can track where the moisture that fell just for this event um, originally evaporated from. And so some of it was locally recycled, but we see here the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea are still um, sources of that moisture. And so we compute that approximately 22% of the moisture that fell just during this flooding event originated directly from the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Conversely, only 11% of the moisture was locally recycled, which is consistent with the previous literature about persistent heavy terrestrial rainfall events can't be sustained from local moisture recycling alone. And so to wrap up here, and take a data-driven approach to identify these forecasts of opportunity um, and uh, we've detected decadal variability in subseasonal predictive skill um, using explainable machine learning to actually identify physically meaningful sources of subseasonal forecasts of opportunity that are applicable for the real world, and then identifying the sources of these predictability. Ultimately, this can increase skill and confidence in our regionalized subseasonal forecasts. And so I have some um, contact information here, um, and I'm happy to take questions um, now or in the document. Mark, I can let you take back over. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, I see one question in the uh, uh, document already here, and it is... What methods were used for assessing the input sensitivity for prediction confidence? Uh, were there, was there consideration for the correlation between input grid points or were they treated independently? Um, okay, so for the assessing input sensitivity, so here we use a method called gradients, which is just computing the change um, in the output relative to the input grid cell. Um, for the other relevance heat map that I showed, this was a method called integrated gradients, um, which is very similar, but it's actually um, multiplying by the input map. Um, so those are two different um, XAI sensitivity analyses. And then was there consideration for correlation between? Uh, no. So grid points were treated independently. Each individual grid cell was considered an independent predictor. However, um, the networks are able to pick up on um, or, or to learn correlation amongst um grid cells. And so that's like a reason here we can see it's not necessarily using every single grid cell in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Some um, seem to be a lot more sensitive than others. And part of that has to do with the network learning that if I just look at this grid cell, it's likely capturing a lot of the uh, patterns from nearby grid cells. Um, there's another question I can read out loud. Go ahead, please. Okay. How can these methods be used for, sorry, I see it changing. How can these methods be used for prediction beyond the posteriori analysis? Um, that is um, a great question. So for this, you know, we're looking at identifying the sources of predictability, but actually to be able to use these in real time. So one is if you're making week three to four forecasts, you don't want to just be using one input variable like North Atlantic salinity anomalies. And so the idea would be that we're using ML to 
pinpoint new sources of predictability to be incorporated into our forecasting models. And also a project um, that is just starting now, but a number of other people in the forecasting space are doing is actually building these ML models for real-time forecasting that give a real-time quantification of confidence. So this would become really important in the forecasting space, where instead of going back and looking at the confidence and the accuracy, to actually look at the confidence in real time um, and get a measure of the amount of certainty in that prediction um, beyond, say, climatology. All right. Um, I think I captured the main point of each of answers there. Um, if you want to add to what I had quickly jotted down for notes there, please go ahead. But we should probably move on to our next speaker. And so thank you very much, Mary Beth. Thank um, you. And let's go ahead and switch our speaker here. And... Okay, Nachman, you look like you're taking over here. That, yep, looks great. Can you see my screens? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Nakbin Choi at Georgia Mason University. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to show our results in this webinar. Now, today I'll talk about the performance of UFPA in terms of moist static energy, especially in polar winter intrasignal tropical waves. And this study is working with Professor Christina Stein. Yeah, this figure is well known for the predictability of each R system component. And you can see in here the predictability of the atmosphere rapidly decrease and predictability is almost gone after two weeks. Uh, while ocean predictability is much higher in long-term time scales. So uh, here, sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction is one of the challenges. Uh, the importance of intra-seasonal variability is shown in this figure. Uh, this figure shows the ratio of intra-seasonal to total variance of precipitation. And maybe you can see the intra-seasonal variability is higher in the tropics, especially in the, here is the MGO active region. Uh, and the activity of MGO in tropics has a significant impact in worldwide, as shown in this figure. Especially in the boreal winter, this MGO influence reaches North America and Europe. Thus, to successful S2S prediction, the state-of-the-art copper climate model is necessary. And an understanding of the atmosphere and ocean copper process in the model is also important. In this study, we used the moist static energy as a diagnostic variable to explore tropical waves. Uh, the moisture static energy is one of the indices to show convective activity in the tropics defined as this formula. And we can predict this moisture static energy by this moisture static energy tendency in this formula. Uh, it would be useful tool for understanding the interesting behavior of tropical waves. So, for example, in this figure is the Filakiladis diagram in the tropics. And in this space time spectra, the most static energy ratio in here is the world MGO signal and westward equatorial loss blue wave, and also have some power in the past is the world Kelvin wave. So, in this study, uh, this study aims to evaluate the performance of UFPA for tropical waves based on the most static energy budget. And UFPA is a pre-coupled model as shown in here. It includes of the 
atmosphere and land, and also ocean and sea ice, and aerosol and waves. And this model has a quarter degree in horizontal resolution, and the hind cast is conducted from April 2012 to March 2018 in each first and fifth with the 35 days of forecasting. And in this study, we only use the polar winter from November to April because this winter is peak season of MJO. And the observational data is obtained from the ECMWF era 5 reanalysis. And we also use the time and space filter to separate tropical waves based on Philocularis time space spectra. For example, this figure shows the Hubble plot of the most energy 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 anomaly. It seems uh, very noisy in here, uh, but when we filter by each criterion shown in here, then which is the based on the Philocularis diagram, and we can obtain the clear signal of MJO in here and Kelvin wave and equatorial loss wave wave. So we use the filtered signal from the, this diagram. And first of all, uh, this figure shows the, the climatology of the total moist energy in the winter and the mean bias. Uh, this moist static energy is maximum over the, this one per region. And in here, USPA looks very good to reproduce the mean state of moist static energy. And here, the right-hand side figure shows the difference between NR5 and USPA. Uh, but as you can see in here, the difference is less than uh, point, uh, 0.1%. That means the USPA has very uh, good performance in mean bias. However, when you focus on the moisture static energy budget, we can find some errors in UFPA. And this figure shows the read and leg regression of moisture, moist static energy tendency to standardize the moist static energy averaged in Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific Ocean. And you can see in here, this uh, red dashed line is total moist static energy tendency, and the other one is each uh, com decompose term for the horizontal advection and vertical advection and surface heat plots. And in observation, the total most static energy peaks before about the one week, while the UFPA shows the much rate peak in total tendency and more earlier peak in the in surface heat plots in here. And this behavior is very similarly shown in uh, also in Western Pacific region. Uh, for detail, the latent heat flux seems dominant factor to make moisture energy tendency error in both basins. In this figure, this black contour line, uh, black line indicates that the total moisture static energy tendency and this dashed line is USPA. And in here, the green line indicates the latent heat flux. And you can see in here, the uh, latent heat flux has early peak than observation. And the general advection of the most static energy is also shifted, especially in the, here, the Western Pacific. And it indicates the uh, variability of the moist energy is not rarely produced in USPA, and it might be related to degrading of the MJ forecast skill. Especially in the field of the most static energy charge and discharge for MJO, USPA has less moist static energy charge until zero days. Uh, we can integrate total moist static energy budget before zero day as shown in this uh, shaded areas. So here the this accumulated energy can be used for convection in zero days. And comparing with the observation, UFPA has about uh, just 90% of 
total energy to develop MJO than observation. And here, this the uh, less charge energy uh, possibly makes UFA uh, MJO to more weaker than observation. So this figure shows phase and amplitude error of MJO in UFP8. And in actual broken skill, uh, this UFP8 clearly shows the weak MJO during all forecasting time. And we think the, this might come from the less charged mode static energy. And we did the same analysis for Kelvin waves in here. It's very same figure as before, but we're using the Kelvin wave filter. In the case of the Kelvin wave, more static energy velocity seems uh, reasonable comparing to MJO in here. Uh, but there is some difference in each terms. It might be the high frequency noisy, uh, but we can still find there are some errors in latent heat flux in both basins. And the Rossby wave also has some error in each by tendency term, uh, but the total tendency looks uh, reasonable due to these errors are canceled each other. Uh, but still the latent heat flux has some problem in both basins. That means the uh, UF P8 has error in the tropical latent heat flux. So we further evaluated latent heat flux in the tropics with the composition based on the bulk formula shown in here. Uh, <clears throat> latent heat flux bulk formula estimates the surface latent heat flux by the surface wind, wind speed and difference of moisture in the sea surface and near surface. And the sur sea surface moisture is calculated as the saturated specific humidity as sea surface temperature in this formula. And also we decompose uh, each variable to 35 days mean and each day deviation. Then we can get the two dominant terms by here the wind driven and thermodynamic term. Uh, before I move on, here is the climatology of latent heat flux in ETA5 and USP8. And here the positive means the upward flux. That means the heat flux from ocean to atmosphere. And surprisingly, the, we can see in here, the UFS P8 overestimate the latent heat flux up to the 40%, especially in maritime continent. Uh, then here is the uh, lead and leg regression of latent heat flux to most static energy with the MGL filter. It seems that the wind-driven term is more dominant to total latent heat flux and both latent heat flux are uh, latent heat flux terms are misrepresented in the UFP8. Uh, thus UFP8 also have some problem in the latent heat flux variability. So we try to find some of the error source for latent heat flux variability by decomposition. Uh, compared to the wind-driven and thermodynamic term, this amplitude is much larger in wind-driven term in here, which means the uh, among these two terms, the wind-driven term is more dominant as shown in previous slide. In the Burke formula, latent heat flux variability is uh, overestimated over the uh, maritime continent in here. And both terms also shows overestimation of the over the tropics in here and here. So first, in the wind-driven term, we can find uh, dry air humidity mean bias in with PA over here. You can see this uh, UFP8 has less moisture over the tropics. Uh, but the saturated humidity doesn't show a uh, significant bias over tropics. Thus, the mean delta Q 
uh, phase which is difference between these two terms is overestimated in the tropics and which can enhance the wind driven error. Also, we can find wind speed errors in maritime continent in here, which is the uh, standard deviation of the uh, wind speed, wind speed. Uh, it is it presumably due to the complex terrain in this the island region, and it seems the dominant factor to show wind driven error. Then here are the thermodynamic terms. The dominant error occurs in the variability of the here the delta Q over the, this tropical region. Especially this uh, error comes from the uh, QSST, means the saturated surface moisture, which is account for over 60% of total error. And also we can see mean bias of wind speed enhanced this thermodynamic error. And because the thermodynamic error is dominated by QSST, that means the surface temperature from UF to PA also has error in this region. Uh, the performance of UF PA for means uh, sea surface temperature is very good as showing in less than 1% of error in here. Uh, but the variability of the sea surface temperature is much overestimated uh, in the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific, uh, which is the dominant error source for latent heat flux variability. And then we consider that is the overestimated sea surface temperature variability is due to the strong ocean and atmosphere coupling in the UFPA. Uh, so here is, is uh, one of the ongoing work for the exploring the atmosphere and ocean coupling. And this figure shows the relationship between latent heat flux and delta Q in selected basins in simultaneously. And here, here the latent heat flux from ocean modulate the atmosphere by shown in delta Q and comparing this observation is in here the red wing one is eta 5 and blue one is US PA and US PA shows shows more sensitive response as the slope and the more higher correlation that means the more strong relationship between atmosphere and ocean and which might be due to strong coupling in the thermodynamic process, uh, but still we are still a little bit struggling to get the metric to diagnose the atmosphere and ocean coupling. So if you have any comments, uh, we are welcome to accept your comment. So here is the summary for the UFPA evaluation of the moisture static energy in the tropics. And, uh, Total moist static energy is reasonably reproduced in UFPA. However, the moist static energy project is misrepresented in UFPA, especially in MJO. Uh, the significant error shows in latent heat flux, and we decomposed it based on the Bragg formula. And we find the UFPA overestimated latent heat flux in the mean bias and variability. The surface wind error in the Martin continent induces wind driven error and sea surface temperature error is dominant for uh, thermodynamic error. And sea surface temperature bias is presumably due to strong atmosphere and ocean coupling in UFPA. So here is the all of my presentation today and thank you for attention. All right. Thank you. We have time for questions. I see uh, one getting typed in right now, so we'll just wait for that. And, um, in fact, while she's typing here, I'm going to go ahead and ask one here. You're talking about the uh, um, excessive uh, ocean atmosphere coupling, and I'm seeing that she's <laughs> talking a little bit about this as well. Um, 
Uh, you know, when most of the quantities that you're looking at here, kind of the differences maximize right around the maritime continent and Oceania. Um, is it, you know, why do we have such, if, why are we saying that it's over uh, estimated ocean coupling there? Ocean atmosphere coupling there, not elsewhere as much. Is it? Is it? Are we not modeling the land sea interactions um, that well? And I'll just tack on <laughs> Jan's question here because it looks like she had about the same one here. What are the possible causes of overestimated ocean atmospheric coupling? Yeah, this is the our the ongoing research to find out why the model overestimates. The, the, the ocean and atoms coupling, but we are just considering the because the in copper model usually the atmospheric component and ocean components just coupling with the some uh, coupler, and we thought this the exchange of heat flux might be more sensitive to each other. So that is a uh, remaining test for us. Okay. Um, I see Christiana is actually typing in it's part of the answer there, so I will let her type that in and see if there are, are there any other questions. All right. Well, um, uh, I would like to thank both of the uh, speakers. Uh, very interesting talks today. Um, and um, if you have any other questions, um, you can post them in this document even after the fact. Maybe alert me of any changes in there, and I, I can have the uh, speakers alerted to it as well. Um, so anyway, I thank you very much for attending today. I thank you uh, to the speakers yet again, and um, uh, hopefully we will see you again in a month or so for uh, another round. <laughs>